Good evening and welcome to tonight's Fairfax County Democratic Committee Forum entitled Dark Money is Coming for Our Children, Exposing the Right-Wing Agenda to Destroy Public Education. This forum is being recorded. I'm Sandra Claussen, the forum moderator and FCDC National, Chair, National Affairs Committee Chair. Our National Affairs Forum examine matters of national importance for the purpose of informing engaging and inspiring citizen action. I first want to recognize and thank those who contributed to organizing, co-sponsoring and promoting this forum, including my National Affairs Committee colleagues, Barrett Brogue, Bill Berkson, Howard Carlin, Stephen Hall, Paul Norsey, Michelle Menapace, Sherry Harowitz, uh, Paul Jamison, Walter Carlson and Andy Scalise. Although FCDC is hosting, this has become a statewide democratic event. We appreciate the following Democratic Virginia Democratic committees who clearly understanding the gravity and timeliness of this issue have joined us as co-sponsors. They are the Democratic committees of Goochland County, Hanover County, Green County, Nottoway County, Montgomery County, Madison County, Alexandria, Falls Church City, Washington, rural, um, Washington County Rural, Essex, Richmond County, Powhatan County, Prince William County, Suffolk, Arlington, Isle of Wright, Rappahannock County, Louisa County, Northampton County, Charlottesville, Orange County, Franklin County, Democratic Committee, Westmoreland County, Virginia, Radford City, Rockbridge County, Fauquier County, Rockingham County, Warren County, Gloucester, Roanoke City, Shenandoah County, 1st Congressional District, Henrico, and Accomack County. That's a lot. We also thank FCDC Executive Director Dominic Thompson, who set up and managed our promotional technology and are grateful for Greg Van Brandon's assistance. And finally, we offer attribution and gratitude for our graphic to political cartoonist Khalil Bendeb and otherwords.com. After my introduction, our program will proceed in three parts. In part one, our, our four nationally eminent panelists will deliver presentations laying out their research and analysis that exposes and explains the right-wing agenda to destroy public education. After all four speakers have concluded their formal presentations, in part two, I will invite them to engage each other in an open roundtable dialogue. Part three will be Q&A. I encourage forum attendees to write your questions for the speakers in the webinar Q&A box throughout the speaker's formal remarks and the roundtable discussion. And please specify to which speaker or speakers you are directing your question. During Q&A, I'll ask my National Affairs Committee colleagues to read some of your and some of our committee prepared questions to the panelists. I'm pleased to note that several FCDC endorsed school board candidates registered for this forum. If any of you choose to ask a question, please identify yourself as a school board candidate along with your question so we can recognize you. Okay, let's begin with an overview. Right-wing Republican leaders and oligarchs are escalating attacks on public education as their spear tip against Democrats. These attacks are coordinated and well-funded, but not new. They have for decades sought to dismantle public education by reducing public support to facilitate moving public funds from public to for-profit managed schools. Rather than focusing explicitly on promoting privatization, their coordinated right-wing dark money and special interest bankrolled efforts have deployed parent groups such as Moms for Liberty and other schemes to make it appear that there is wide opposition to public school policies when in fact, polls and surveys overwhelmingly reveal that public education is immensely popular. Their current tactics are to concoct social issue and culture war traps by attacking, attacking evidence-based curricula, black and LGBTQ plus communities, harassing school board members, administrators and staff and threatening to burn books all with the intent to foment parental and community fair, fear and hostility toward public schools that incites disruption, intimidation and violence, and ultimately a transfer of public school management and funds to, to for-profit alternatives proffered by the right. School choice is rooted in these efforts. 
the transfer of control over public schools or any public goods, which represent broadly the public good of the community, to the private sector and their executives evades oversight and accountability, which is a key goal of the privatization effort. Education is a multi-million dollar market and right-wing oligarchs are eager to get their hands on it and the taxpayer dollars that help fund it, while Republican politicians are eager to protect their wealthy donors from having to contribute their fair share in taxes to strengthen public schools. Shrinking public education also furthers the overarching Republican Party goal of drastically reducing the public sector overall. Privatization also significantly undermines teachers' unions, thereby reducing the voice and power of teachers to affect the terms and conditions of their workplace. Unions are also a strong and active part of the Democratic base, and hobbling them hobbles their capacity to support Democrats. A clear threat is that this privatized education system will be mobilized and manipulated by right-wing leaders to establish a class-based system of education where most of America's children are segregated into privately managed, publicly funded schools that censor control and limit exposure to a robust evidence-based curricula and that focus primarily on training compliant workers rather than producing a well-informed and critically thinking citizenry. This privatized system also enables right-wing leaders to cre create paths to fund religious and even mythological indoctrination rather than scientific reasoning and humanistic thinking. Preparing the people for democratic citizenship was a major reason for the creation of public schools. The founding fathers maintained that the success of American democracy would depend on the competency of its citizens and that preserving democracy would require an educated population that could understand political and social issues, participate wisely in, in civic life, and resist tyrants. In the 1830s, Massachusetts legislator Horace Mann advocated for the creation of public schools that would be universally available to all children, free of charge and funded by the state. He emphasized that a public investment in education would benefit the whole nation. The original reasons for public schools, preparing people for jobs and citizenships, unifying a diverse population and promoting equity remain well relevant and urgent today. The Republican agenda to dismantle public education will reverse all of these. Our forum experts will examine and expose this right-wing dark money funded Republican agenda to dismantle public education and the threat it poses to our children, society and democracy. To begin the discussion, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Morris T. Cunningham, author of Dark Money and the Politics of School Privatization. Professor Cunningham retired in 2021 as Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. His work has been distributed throughout the Independent Media Institute and has appeared in the Boston Globe, Alternet, Tampa Bay Times, The Daily Progress in Virginia, Idaho um, Education News, New Hampshire Bulletin, the Detroit Free Press, and the Portland Press Herald, and in Diane Ravitch's blog. Professor Cunningham, we are eager to hear your remarks. Please go ahead. Oh, you need to unmute. Unmute. Just a minute. Oh, I got it. I thought the monitor was okay. going to be good. Thank, okay. thank you. For Thank you for that nice introduction. I, I do want to say my, my list of uh, publishing credits would have expanded somewhat, but um, a, a, a publication just informed me they could not use my piece on Moms for Liberty because the, the I actually quoted the, the uh, uh, former president of the United States uh, about something he said about his approach to women. And then I also quoted a member of, of Moms for Liberty, and, and both of those quotes proved to be too uh, powerful, shall we say, to be printed in a family outlet. So that I lost my opportunity there. Um, Sandra, I want to thank you particularly for putting this together. Um, this is a great forum. Uh, I'm glad to be with my friends, Diane, Lisa, and Jennifer. And I want to give a special shout out to somebody in Virginia who uh, uh, really uh, works hard, takes the incoming, and fights back. And that's my friend, Vanessa Hall. I'm, I know she's out there. And I'm glad we can be together uh, today, even just on video. Um, 
Sanders right. This is really a fight. It's a, it's it's a, it's an attack on democracy for all the reasons she spoke about with regard to education. Go to getting to democracy. The path through that is public education. It is unions. It is a deprofessionalization of what teachers do. Uh, a direct attack on public education. And and what do the funders want out of it? Well, they don't want to pay taxes for uh, uh, other children's. Uh, other people's children to learn. Uh, they want to keep their own taxes low. Um, th that's clear. It's clear in the research. Uh, and some feel it's a great opportunity to make money. Um, you know, Rupert Murdoch said it was a $500 billion uh, market. The late John Walton of the Walton family said it was a $750 billion market. And so there's a lot of incentive there for that. And as we see with some of the folks um, uh, attacking uh, uh, schools, including Moms for Liberty, we'll talk a little bit about them. It's a project of the Christian nationalist right, which had a big victory today in the Supreme Court, by the way. Maybe we'll get to that. The affirmative action case is really a case uh, in which the court panders to its constituency in the Christian right and also panders to its constituency um, among uh, the oligarchs who think they got here, even the even the ones who are heirs of great of great wealth think they got there on their own merit. Um, so that is booming out there uh, as well. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a few other organizations. What I want to mention, a couple I want to mention right now uh, at the beginning is is called the Council for National Policy. It is a sort of clearinghouse and directorate of right wing organizations. Uh, it was founded by several uh, right-wingers, including a guy named Morton Blackwell, who also founded the Leadership Institute. I'm going to be talking about them. Um, but ultimately, it's an attack on democracy, not just public education, but on, on, on democracy. So before Moms for Liberty got started and all these sorts of things, I was working um, uh, uh, like seven years ago in 2016, I got interested in an attack on uh, uh, public schools in Massachusetts. It was, it was a charter school ballot question. And uh, what piqued my interest was the amount of dark money that uh, was reported to be coming into it. I hadn't really worked a whole lot on dark money then, but it was so much money. I know a lot about Massachusetts politics. And I thought, well, this is gonna set all kinds of records. It'll shatter records in Massachusetts. And who has that kind of money? And I found out they didn't have to tell us. Well, I said that. That's just wrong. That's anti-democratic. People have an absolute right to know who's paying to influence them. And that set me down my path uh, to groups like what I now call neoliberal groups, because I have to distinguish them from the groups that have arisen since 2021. Families for Excellence Schools, Educators for Excellence, and a group called National Parents Union. And I mentioned National Parents Union because the, the leadership of it is kind of an outgrowth of Families for Excellent Schools in some ways, and from an organization started right after the defeat of the charter school proposal in, in, in 2016, um, a group called Massachusetts Parents United that was funded by the Walton family, okay? And the thing that's most, one of the things that's most interesting to be about National Parents Union is it is every bit as phony as all these other groups. Um, but the National Parents Union, their first year of operation was 20 20. And who do you suppose was their biggest contributor? It was an operation called the Vila Education Fund. What's Vila? It's really a joint venture of Charles Koch and the Waltons. So here you have Charles Koch giving money to, to, to this operation. It's a neoliberal. It, it presents itself. The public face of it is, is people of color. And you've got Koch funding it. And I'll tell you why that interests me, because Koch is also funding the far right on, on, on in this. OK, parents defending education, a far right ally of, of them. So they go about it differently, the far right operations and the neoliberal. But the ultimate goal remains the same for the Waltons, for Koch, and that is to bring down public education, open it up to free market solutions. OK, now. All right. So there's a little bit about why I get into this. And then in 2021, all of a sudden, parents defending education was out there. Moms for Liberty was out there. Um, if you're paying attention, the Mons for Liberty Conference National Summit called the Joyful Warriors Summit because they're all so joyful. Um, I could go on. We, we, I could do two hours on that alone. 
Um, you may have noticed in the news lately as, it, as the press has begun uncovering that uh, their leaders and their invited guest speakers keep citing Hitler uh, as a source with great admiration. Um, you may have heard that despite this strong stand in favor of sexual propriety and, and protecting our children from words like cis and, 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 and queer, right? That tomorrow night's, uh, tomorrow afternoon's four o'clock speaker is a serial sexual abuser. The guy who kept me from getting published yesterday because of the language, I, because of quoting him, right? And has a $5 million judgment against him for sexual abuse. But this particular individual is welcome uh, at the Moms for Liberty uh, uh, Joyous Warriors Summit. And of course, you know I'm talking about Donald Trump, okay? Um, Moms for Liberty is a, uh, well, let me say a little bit on how I kind of spot these groups at the beginning. National Parents Union, Mass Parents United, uh, Parents Defending Education, uh, Moms for Liberty, and others, they all have the same creation story. And the creation story goes like this. Several moms get together over the kitchen table and they discuss what they think are the shortcomings of the schools their children go to. And they resolve to join together and try and do something about what they consider the, to be the inadequacies of the public school system. And so the moms get together with a, and they form a group that's always got moms and parents in the title. And then boom, before you know it, they're sitting on several million dollars. How does it happen? What luck? It's not luck. It's all prearranged. As I mentioned, the Council for National Policy is involved in these sorts of things. Leadership Institute is heavily involved in mass in Moms for Liberty. It virtually runs Moms for Liberty. Um, and again, the head of a, that is a guy named Morton Blackwell. Now, you're not going to see Morton Blackwell out front at the National Summit because Morton Blackwell is 83 years old. He's been around so long, he was a Goldwater delegate. Instead, you're going to see suburban moms. But behind, you know, it's like behind the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. There's Morton Blackwell pulling the strings, okay? So that's what, we, that's what we're really seeing. Uh, and the involvement of Blackwell gets you to the Leadership Institute, it gets you to the Council for National Policy, and it begins to fill in the picture of who these folks really are. This is not mom sitting around a kitchen table. This is centrally located. It is centrally directed. It is very sophisticated. These people are very, very uh, uh, good at what they do. The Leadership Institute has trained 250,000 conservative activists, including Kyle Rove and Mitch McConnell. So they know what they're doing, okay? Um, and this will be professionally run. You don't form a little group of moms around the kitchen table or parents around the kitchen table. And then a year later or two years later, you're running a national convention with presidential candidates coming to it, for heaven's sakes. It's coordination. It's the professional involvement of a, of a professional communications firm. In this case, the firm uh, whose president is Rick Scott's former chief of staff and communications director. So one of the things, and maybe Lisa will talk about this because she her shop, hi, Lisa Bowen too, uh, is very good at this. You trace back, if you can't find out exactly who wrote the check, you trace back where the resources are. And from that, you can tell a lot. Lisa's operation, for example, trace back parents defending education to Leonard Leo money. He's the guy who basically gave us the Supreme Court we have. So um, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, Mass uh, Moms for Liberty is Leadership Institute. It's Council for National Policy. It's they did not get by. If you heard this story, they did not uh, 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 create all of this with uh, sales of T-shirts. Right? You'll hear Tina Deskovich says, "Oh, we do sell a lot of T-shirts." Uh, in their first year, they cleared twenty-eight thousand and two dollars in T-shirts. They didn't do all this with T-shirts, folks. It's far beyond that. Parents defending education, as I said, Lisa and Alyssa have have uh, uh, followed the money on that. It, some of it traces back to Leonard Leo. Uh, the president of uh, uh, Parents Defending Education will say, oh, we're all working moms. We work at home. Well, she's been with multiple- Maurice, you have one minute. Perfect. Multiple Coke organizations is where Nicole Neely is out of, okay? She's been working for Coke for years. Uh, again, the creation story where, mo where mom's working from home. Well, mom's working from home raised $3.1 million in their first year. 
you know, baloney. Mom and Neely, oh, I don't want to step on Lisa's line, but Mom Neely paid herself really well and then gave herself a bonus. Um, other people, Erica Sanzi uh, from there. Osra Nomani, who they fired. Well, a bunch of you know Osra Nomani. Oh, I am praying for somebody to do a great piece on Osra Nomani. But this is these are professional political and communications folks. They have employers. Those employers, they are agents of the people with the money. I'll end there. Thank you so much, Morris. We look forward to hearing some more from you during the roundtable discussion and q and I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Jennifer C. Berkshire, who is the co-author of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. She's also the creator and co-host of the Education Policy Podcast, Have You Heard? Her work, her work explores the intersection of public education and politics, she teaches in the journalism program at uh, Boston College and the education studies program at Yale University. Her writing about education and politics has appeared in The Nation, The New Republic, The Baffler, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and other publications. Please proceed, Dr. Berkshire. Well, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And I mean, I have some big shoes to step in, thanks to Mo Cunningham. I'm here in Massachusetts, so I feel like I can I can call him Mo. Um, so I, I am going to share some slides with you. Here we go. All right. So we just heard um, a really helpful and informative overview of some of the what that is, is driving the current push to privatize public education. And it's so important to recognize the extent to which these are not actually just mom groups. But what I want to focus on in my 12 minutes, and Sandra, please step in when it's time, because I get very excited when I talk about this stuff. I want to talk about the why that's motivating this vision. And as Sandra mentioned, I do a podcast and I also co-wrote a book. My collaborator is an education historian. And I really didn't know that this was a profession when I was thinking about what I might like to do when I, when I grew up some time ago. And it turns out to just be the most useful person to have on speed dial, because whatever is happening out there, I can call Jack Schneider and ask him two questions. And number one is, has this thing that we're seeing right now ever happened before? And question number two, how did it end? And so the first thing that we need to start out by acknowledging tonight is that what we are seeing unfold around us in Virginia and across the country has absolutely happened before. So there's a slogan, it's very popular right now, and I'm imagining that many of you have heard it, especially those of you who are running for school board. And the slogan is, fund students, not systems. Well, the original version of fund students, not systems, took place right in Virginia, and it was a response to Brown versus Board of Education. And this played out all over the Southern part of the US, starting in the lead up to Brown when conservative elites recognized that the days of being able to keep their schools segregated were numbered. And so instead they pushed for publicly funded private education. They pushed for a system that would fund students, not systems. And what's so important about this is that they received basically a constitutional command that said, you know, that the Constitution, it the Constitution requires a level of equality. That's what Brown versus Board is. And their response to that was, no, thank you. Instead, we're going to set up a private system for the very reason that the Constitution doesn't govern it. And so I want you to remember that, that inequality was part of the original intent. And as we watch what's playing out around the country in state after state where politicians are enacting sweeping private school voucher programs and reciting that program, that same slogan, fund students, not systems. Remember that inequality was the original intent and we have to keep that in mind today. So what does that mean? I took us back to the 1950s already, but we need to actually go further 
to understand what it is that the right is so worked up about. And I am sure that for millions of reasons, you all really have the sense that there is this effort to roll back progress. And often it can be really, you know, it can be hard to just keep up with the sheer deluge of, of headlines. And I'll give you one that you might not have thought about in the context of what we're talking about tonight. That would be the sudden push all over the country to roll back the laws that, that govern child labor. Um, and, and we're seeing this happen in one red state after another. So there's a fascinating history here. It turns out that opposition to a proposed constitutional amendment that would have banned child labor was really the first time that we saw a parents' rights movement in this country. And it would fit exactly what we just heard from Dr. Cunningham. It was really the first, uh, the first AstroTurf campaign in our history. And what happened was that conservative industry groups created parent groups and they made the argument that if we ban child labor, then we were opening the door to the feds to basically go into everyone's houses and, and insert their power into the private domain of the, the family. That they were going to be absolutely insistent that young Sandra was not, say, washing dishes or that you know, young Mo Cunningham wasn't helping out in the, farm, uh, the family farm. That, that, that was how extensive the, the reach of the feds was going to be. And just like now, the anxiety of parents was real, right? There were all kinds of legitimate concerns about where the, the line between government overreach and family authority begins. Um, where it, where that line should be. But what you saw happen, just as you saw today, was that powerful conservative groups saw that anxiety as an opportunity. And what they really wanted to do was to usher in an era that was as unregulated as possible. So here we are today, and the focus of so much of what we're seeing is in the is in the schools. And I don't have to tell you that in, in Virginia because in many ways, it was your governor's election that really set us off on our current moment of parental rights. We have these, we see this happen, you know, decade after decade, but it was really Yunkin's campaign. And what I will insist in our round table was a, a, pretty, a pretty horrible misreading of what happened in Virginia, but that set us on our current path. So why the focus on schools? Well, in her introduction, Sandra, Sandra really laid a lot of it out there. We spend a lot of money on schools. And if rich people didn't have to pay taxes, that would mean you know we could spend a lot less on schools. Some of you have probably seen this graph before. It is a favorite. It comes from the Libertarian Cato Institute. Betsy DeVos used to carry around a copy of this in her Birkin bag. <laughs> and, and the reason that, that libertarians and conservatives are enamored of this is that the, it shows that line going up and up and uh, we see achievement basically remaining flat. Well, what it doesn't acknowledge is that the reason that we spend so much money in this country is that we actually have the broadest understanding of who deserves an education of virtually any country in the world, right? That think about how our understanding of what kinds of kids are deserving of an education, how that has expanded over the years. And that back in the day, if you had a child with special needs, you were pretty much on your own. And now, you know, I, I had the real privilege of working for a year in a school for students with profound special needs. And I came away with the most just intense respect for the people who do the work and also a real understanding of how expensive it is to provide kids with a lot of needs uh, with the kind of education that they deserve. And so you hear this, you see this graph all the time, and it's really to make the case that we should spend a lot less on schools. In fact, the vision that is being the, the sort of logical endpoint of where we're headed right now is one we've already seen. This is a picture of what was known as a pauper school. And the idea was that 
the burden of paying for education rested on the shoulders of families themselves. You all are very familiar with this vision. We call it higher education in this country, right? It's up to you to decide how much you want to invest in your individual child. What happens to the other kids? Nobody cares. So that was actually our vision and we called them pauper schools. We got rid of them for a reason because it was a disaster. And that was a big part of why we came to have public schools in the first place. Okay, so as I mentioned, it can be really hard to keep up with the sheer deluge of headlines and to think about like, you know, like how does today's bad news story, the Supreme Court decision, for example, relate to something like the rollback of child labor or the a push to privatize schools? Or think about there was a Republican candidate who was thankfully defeated in the primary, in the, in the recent Virginia primary. He was running in Shenandoah County. He was arguing that the provision of the Virginia Constitution that requires public education should be eliminated and that $10,000 should be given to parents themselves. Fortunately, he only received 2.5% of the vote. But the reality is we are hearing language like this all across the Republican Party. You will hear language at the Moms for Liberty Summit that starts tomorrow that creeps right up to this line because the vision that they are proposing is one of radical individualism in which only your child matters, no one else's does. And it guarantees a level of inequality that is you know, absolutely, I think, unacceptable. Okay. Nothing will make this country more unequal than privatizing our public schools. If you don't believe me, go to a country where kids have to pay fees in order to attend public schools or what, what uh, stands in for public education. So there is really nothing, there's no conclusion to take away from what's happening today. The sheer level of organization and the speed with which these enormous voucher programs are being, are, are being enacted. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A, just so people get a real sense of what's happening in places like Iowa and Arizona and Florida. You, really, the only conclusion that I can draw from what's happening is that the goal is actually to make the country less equal. And I really believe that that is the through line that connects so much of what we're seeing right now. So what do we do? Well, obviously, I am reaching the end of my time. So you're going to be left on the edge of your seat wondering about that. But I'm just going to leave you with one thought. We didn't just get into this because four moms sat around a kitchen table and then a year later they had a big check from the Koch brothers. <laughs> we got into this because we've lost the capacity to make the case for public education as a public good. And if you don't believe me, just look at how skillfully your governor was able to play on the fears and anxieties of parents who were absolutely desperate to get their kids into the elite magnet school because that's what will put their kids on the path to the Ivy League. When you look at things like that, you realize how completely our rhetoric of public education is a public good has diminished. And what we have instead is a rhetoric of individualism, of competition, of choice, of my kid deserves this and whatever happens to yours, well, that's your business. And if we're gonna fight back, it's gonna mean not only exposing Things like who pays for moms for liberty and calling them out when they say and do something really. One minute, fun. Jennifer. It means that we are going to have to get better at making the case for the absolute urgency of public education. We're going to have to relearn that rhetoric of the public good. And I'm hoping that some of that will start tonight. So thank you for having me. And I can't wait to hear the rest of the program. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Greatly appreciate it. Now, with admiration, I introduce our next speaker, Professor, there she is, Professor Diane Ravitch, a national legend who has been writing about American education for half of a century. She is a historian of education and educational policy analyst and a research professor who earned her BA at Wellesley and her PhD from Columbia University. 
Dr. Radish was appointed to public office by Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. She has published more than a dozen books, including three national bestsellers. She is an activist on behalf of public schools and the author of Slaying Goliath, The Passionate Resistance to Privatization and the Fight to Save America's Public Schools. Please welcome Professor Diane Ravitch. Diane, over to you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be with you uh, for many reasons. One is because what you do is so important. Uh, the Virginia State Democratic Party, I know, has taken a strong stand against the dark money that's promoting privatization. Uh, my wish would be that all 50 state Democratic parties uh, would do the same, because what we're missing right now is public awareness and also some um, pushback. Uh, and Jennifer spoke about that, as, as did Maurice. Uh, some pushback, first of all, the public exposure, because the public doesn't really understand what's going on. And secondly, the, uh, the Democratic Party taking a stand. And I've been writing about this since, well, my first book on the subject came out in 2010. And as some of you may know, I have a, a, had had a long career as a conservative voice in education uh, in favor of high stakes testing and charter schools, occasionally an article uh, for voucher schools. And all of my advocacy occurred before any of this was in place, except for testing. But when the No Child Left Behind testing came up short, I began to realize uh, it was not achieving what I had hoped. Uh, and as charters became a reality, I mean, they started out in 1988 and just uh, grew like uh, wildfire because of bipartisan support. Uh, Bill Clinton set aside millions of dollars to start new charter schools. And that four to six million dollar program of 1994 is now 440 million a year uh, to expand uh, charter schools and create new charter schools. So the one of the big problems with stopping the privatization movement is that the Democratic Party is divided. If the Democratic Party understood and agreed uh, that the threat to public education is in fact a threat to democracy and that it is an effort to split Democrats and to uh, turn citizens into consumers and that once you begin, and Jennifer said this quite well, once you begin to think as, of an individual, well, what's in it for me uh, and lose all sight of what's good for society, what's good for America, what's good for our community, uh, then you are no longer thinking as a citizen, you're thinking uh, as a consumer. And you may recall some years ago, Jeb Bush gave a talk about school choice at one of the Republican national conventions. And he said that choosing your school should be like going into an aisle of the, the, the milk section of the grocery store. And do you want 0%, 1%, 2%, 4% uh, uh, almond milk, soy milk, chocolate milk? Well, no, choosing a school should not be like that. Uh, these are not public goods. The public schools belong to the public. And there is right now this very well-organized effort to destroy them. Uh, I began writing about it in a book I published in 2010 because I had been involved in a number of very conservative think tanks uh, at the Hoover Institution and at the Thomas B. Fordham uh, Foundation in Washington. And I saw this emerging, this privatization movement. And when I began writing about it, people thought that I, maybe I was a little off the wall, that I was being over the top, who knows, hysterical, because I saw what was happening, which is that a lot of big money was lining up behind the effort to open charter schools and even vouchers. Uh, and at the time I wrote 13 years ago, the charter movement uh, was taking off. Uh, it had a lot of support from people like Bill Gates and uh, you know, you had Michelle Rhee in Washington, D.C., and, and Joel Klein and Michael Bloomberg in New York, uh, and the movie Waiting for Superman that said that somehow charter schools would save us. Well, what I believe, based on my experience, is that charter schools are the first step towards vouchers, because once you begin to uh, persuade the public that they have a right to make a choice, and they should do it with public money, uh, that people begin to fall away and say, well, they, they fall just as they fall for advertising campaigns, that something is the biggest and the best and better than what you were using already. Uh, so they fall for charter advertising campaigns. Uh, the organization that I helped to create called the Network for Public Education uh, has uh, tracked charter school closures and they're like daylilies. They open and close. Some of them close, uh, get federal funding and never open at all. 
Some of them close within the first three years that they open. They're very um, uh, undependable, unreliable, unstable, and that's not good for children. Uh, we know from many studies that charter schools are generally no better than public schools, but they do take money away from public schools. And now, uh, I certainly did not see, uh, despite the fact that I've been writing about this for 13 years, but I did not see that when the pandemic was over, that there would be this explosion of voucher legislation. Uh, what I learned in these years is that the dark money is real. It's the Koch brothers, it's Betsy DeVos, it's billionaires and that you never heard of, uh, like Wilkes and Dunn in Texas are billionaires who want every child to attend uh, an evangelical church school. Uh, America is a country that has th thrived in large part because we have this tremendous diversity and we have been at least in the last 50 years trying to expand the tent and bring everybody in and give everyone a chance to be part of this great country. Uh, what we see today with the Supreme Court and, and uh, the Republican Party is they find they play to people's fears that there's too much diversity that we should all go to homogeneous schools and one of the slogans I've heard from the governor of Texas and, and others is they want education, not indoctrination. And so what do they suggest for education, not indoctrination? The children should get doctors to go to religious schools. Well, in, in Florida, one, I'm sorry, in North Carolina, one of the schools there has a, has a requirement that teachers have to know how to speak in tongues if they wanna teach in the school. They don't need to be certified as teachers, but they need to meet the religious requirements. That's indoctrination, not education. So this is a very frightening moment uh, as, as I see it, uh, because this is a multi-pronged attack. It's, uh, it's an attack against very wealthy people paying their share. Uh, they don't wanna be taxed to pay for poor kids to go to school. Uh, and it's also an attack on teachers unions. We hear all the time how terrible teachers unions are. And the labor movement, I could go into a whole other talk about how the labor movement has been so important in giving people an opportunity to move from poverty into the middle class by having an assurance of their, their health care, their pensions, uh, and, and their wages. Uh, and the, the very wealthy in this country want nothing more at this point than to destroy unions. And the last strong unions standing are the teachers' unions. And so they maintain this attack that the teachers' unions are somehow the great villain of education. Uh, and when they're not attacking unions, they're attacking teachers. And then they don't understand why we have a shortage of teachers. Uh, almost every state, every district that I'm aware of has a shortage, unless they're paying very high salaries and most places are not. So we have this multi-pronged attack. Uh, the goal of it is to cut taxes, uh, to stifle and eliminate, if possible, the teachers unions. And what we need is a citizen movement. And I think that the most important uh, group that might that should stand up for public schools, frankly, is the Democratic Party. And as I mentioned earlier, the division within the party has hurt public schools. Uh, it used to be that the Republicans were for high stakes testing and uh, privatization. And uh, there were even some who like, like Reagan who wanted vouchers, uh, but the Democratic party was always the party of public education and played down high stakes testing. Uh, with No Child Left Behind, there were more Democrats voting for George uh, W. Bush's programs than there were Republicans. And when Obama produced his own program, Race to the Top, it was just like No Child Left Behind, only more punitive than race than uh, No Child Left Behind. So you have people in Congress like Hakeem Jeffries, who has a lot of charter schools in his district. He supports charter schools. Um, Michael Bennett of Colorado, the senator there, is a strong charter school supporter. And when, once you agree that school choice is the answer, uh, that's a big problem. Uh, it's a problem because it undercuts your defense of the very nature of public education, which is that it belongs to the public, not to private corporations, that it should never be a uh, for-profit, and that privatization uh, really strikes at uh, democratic control of, of democratic schools. Uh, and so in conclusion, I would say that uh, what I hope you'll do is to reach out to democratic parties uh, and, and across the state of Virginia, but, but especially in other states, because the, the rallying for public education has to be the grassroots rallying. And if we lose public education, as, as Maurice said, we, uh, we're at risk of losing our democracy. There's so many attacks on democracy right now with uh, attacks on voting rights and 
uh, demands for censorship and book banning and these, these uh, uh, dark money funded groups who are attacking the schools and attacking teachers. I really worry about the future of our country if the citizenry don't stand up for what belongs to them. And uh, you know, we have, when you talk about parental rights, it seems the only parental rights that count in the eyes of ideologues like DeSantis uh, are, the whites, are the rights of straight white parents who have straight white children. But if you happen to be uh, African-American, you have no parental rights. If you happen to be uh, the parent of a child who is uh, trans or LGBT, you have no rights. These are not the parental rights that they're interested in. Uh, so the whole uh, attack on public education, whether it's CRT uh, or the censorship or the book banning or the arguments over masking, it's all a great facade. And the facade is to cover up for the privatization movement because people actually like public schools. And every time there has been a referendum on vouchers, uh, it's been turned down. Uh, I wanna leave you with just one thought about vouchers. They don't work. Uh, when they, they used to talk about saving poor kids from, public, uh, from failing public schools, we now know that in every state that has a universal voucher program, the overwhelming majority of students who get vouchers are already in private schools. They're already in religious schools. So what these uh, red state politicians are doing is creating a, uh, an entitlement program for well-to-do families because people who have their, their kids in a school that costs 30 to 35,000 a year will suddenly get a windfall of $10,000 mm -hmm. because uh, when, when they remove the income limits as they have in many states, uh, it's just a pass through to those affluent families. The second thing you should know is that uh, the kids from public schools who take vouchers do less well than their peers in public schools. So you're really, uh, when you pay for a kid to leave public school, uh, you're paying for him to go to a subprime school. He's not gonna be going to uh, uh, the uh, top school in, in any of your cities or in, in Washington. He won't be at Sidwell Friends or, or any of the great schools in our country that are private schools because the voucher doesn't pay for it. What it will pay for though is a subprime sub quality school where teachers may or may not be certified. Uh, and in those states that have vouchers, uh, you will be paying for religious education uh, that is, first of all, inferior to public education, does not, a school that does not have certified teachers or certified principals. And, you know, as I first see, as I overlook this scene, I think to myself, don't these people have any patriotism? I mean, it, it, there, it used to be the case that we would look to public schools as the great unifying institution, the great American democratic uh, conception in which all people would have equal opportunity. But we underfund our schools and the more we open charter schools, the more we fund vouchers, the worse off public schools are because they will be left with the kids that the charter schools don't want and the voucher schools don't want. And they will have the greatest proportion of the kids with high needs uh, and they will not One be- One minute, Diane. Properly. So my plea to you is get active, uh, I know you're on this call because you are activists, but I want to urge you to be very concerned, inform yourself, uh, read the work of Josh Cowan on vouchers because Josh is an experienced voucher researcher and he's put it all together and said, uh, we can't support vouchers because they're bad for kids. So we have a lot of politicians that are going off the edge of the cliff, only they're not doing it, they're pushing the kids off. And we, we have to come to the defense of our public schools. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ravitch. I really appreciate it. Um, now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Lisa Graves. She's the executive director of True North Research and president of the board of the Center for Media and Democracy. Lisa has testified before Congress and spearheaded several breakthrough investigations into those distorting American democracy and public policy, including, including Alec Exposed. Her research was featured in the Oscar-nominated documentary, The 13th, and in Bill Moyers, The United States of Alec. She previously served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Clinton and Bush administrations and Chief's Counsel for nominations for uh, Senator Patrick Leahy on the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Graves is frequently cited in news stories and critically acclaimed books, and her articles and opinions have been published in major
papers of record. Uh, Ms. Graves, please share your insights. Thank you so much, Sandra. It's genuinely an honor to be on this panel with Diane, with Mo, with Jennifer. I mean, I just want to thank you and Dominic and Andrew on the back end of supporting uh, this public forum. Um, I'm honored to speak at it and I uh, just want to note that my organization uh, is nonpartisan, we're neutral, um, and I'm going to be citing some materials that are um, that we've published and others have published, but I also want to speak with you in my personal capacity tonight. Um, I am in fact a Democrat in my <laughs> private life, and um, I uh, am very concerned about some of these trends, and I want to be able to speak uh, candidly with you and give you my personal opinion. So um, first of all, I just want to um, uh, tell you, I'm gonna talk about this in two halves. So the first part is gonna be a little bit of a retrospective. It's gonna to touch on some of the things that Morris mentioned and uh, Diane and Jennifer. And then the second half, I'm gonna focus a bit more on some of the current things that we're seeing. Um, but I, I think I'll begin with just a, a, a brief personal story, which is that about uh, almost 20 years ago, I was um, leading a right-left coalition. Um, and as part of that work, I ended up being invited to go to these Wednesday group meetings uh, that Grover Norquist holds with the right-wing infrastructure. And um, I was uh, there to talk about national security issues. But what struck me at that time, and the first time I heard it, I was astonished. It was that uh, Grover and the right-wing leadership we're talking openly in those meetings about killing public schools, about ending public education in America. And at the time I first heard this, I thought it was so far-fetched. I, I couldn't believe that this was their aspiration. Um, and in fact, they were talking about doing it within the next 20 years. So here we are fast forward about 18 years into the future from those um, expressions of their design, of their desire. And in fact, they have made uh, in essence, tremendous progress or regress in that agenda in terms of really trying to undermine public schools. They've done so um, structurally, that they've done so with the help of the federal government, but also these uh, state governments. Um, but they have also done so in ways that have not expressly made that goal clear. And as Diane mentioned, what we're seeing is a, a and right now is a, a large smokescreen in essence to hide that agenda. Um, because that, that really is the aspiration. And I'll talk a bit more about that later in terms of what's happening right now. But what I want to begin with is um, to just um, affirm what Jennifer said about, you know, this, this, the roots of this are in this regressive sort of corporatist agenda. And it does go back to things that were not on my bingo card for horrible things happening in 2023, like passing laws to allow kids uh, to work um, to basically repeal child labor laws. That was a shock and that is part of this agenda. It's an agenda that um, is represented by some of these very regressive right-wing forces that are trying to roll back a century of progressive laws, including around education and specifically around kids. Um, but I, I also just wanna um, note that, you know, one of the things that I learned when I was first looking into this issue of our public schools a few years ago, when I led the Center for Democracy was, that um, you know, a after Brown versus the Board of Education, after that landmark decision in 1954, unanimous decision by a nonpartisan US Supreme Court, one of the first things that happened was that a guy named Milton Friedman, who I'm sure you've heard of, he's now deceased, but who won uh, what I consider to be a, a prize that was made up, created uh, for the Nobel Prize in economics, was not one of the original Nobel Prizes. Milton Friedman came out in 1955 and his position was that Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided and that the reality uh, was that um, we should not be having um, public schools or government schools and that, and that the solution to segregation was that it should not be public, a public school, but that people should be able to choose free market schools in essence. They should be able to choose a white school a black school or what he described as a mixed school that the free market would solve. The free market doesn't solve this problem or many other problems. We need good public policy to address these problems, but not for people like Milton Friedman. But it's not just Milton Friedman. Um, Charles Koch, who uh, Mo mentioned, um, is not just one of the richest billionaires in America or the world. He's also someone whose very first organization that he 
uh, Health launch was called the Center for Independent Education. And it was created to support the creation of purely private schools, in essence, in reaction to Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and uh, that thing, the Center for Independent Education, attacked a public education at every level, primary, secondary education, and universities. And the idea that Charles Koch and his right-hand man then, uh, George Pearson, articulated was the idea that you know, basically millionaires should not have to pay for the education of other people's workers. You can see these publications, they're on uh, our Substack site at True North Research. Um, and you know, one of the pieces, one of the big first things that this Center for Independent Education did was um, create uh, uh, a book. I'm gonna look at it here, I'm not gonna show it on the screen, but you can, uh, you can look it up. And um, it's called The 12 Year Sentence. And it was attack, an attack on the idea of mandatory public schools. It featured a child on the cover with like um, a, a mugshot. Um, this hostility to the idea of public schools that Charles Koch was pushing forward now 50 years ago runs deep. And Charles Koch really is, in my view, singular in the depth, breadth, and duration of his agenda and his commitment to this agenda. And the number of organizations like the Cato Institute, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the author of the graph, that deeply misleading graph that Jennifer uh, uh, highlighted, um, and so many of these other groups have Koch funding, which are aligned with his vision of really um, this long-standing vision of destroying public education. But it's not just Charles Koch and his various groups, Institute for Humane Studies or uh, Cato Institute or, or the others. It's also um, these other very wealthy families, many of whom have never even gone to public schools themselves. Uh, they didn't go, their kids don't go. Uh, like Betsy DeVos didn't send her kids to public schools, uh, has total antipathy toward public schools, except for that she described before she became uh, the Secretary of Education under Trump, that she wasn't opposed to the idea of public education, just public schools meaning she wanted those public dollars to be fed into the private sector, into private religious education. That was her objective. And again, it's not just Betsy DeVos and the DeVos family fortune from the Prince, uh, uh, found the Prince fortune or the Amway fortune. It's also the Bradley Foundation, which is led by another billionaire, Art Pope, who's famous for his discount you know, dollar stores and who has um, helped lead a foundation, the Bradley Foundation, that has been spending hundreds of millions of dollars on trying to privatize our schools. But not just that, they've also been at the heart of uh, funding briefs to the US Supreme Court to uh, attack public unions, particularly the Friedrichs case and the Janus case, uh, and secretly funding those briefs in order to try to change the law. And they were very clear about why they were doing so. It was to, it was to attack the Democratic Party, attack the power of, of, you know, of, of unions in our democracy, and also to advance this privatization agenda. And Bradley isn't just our Pope, it's also Cleta Mitchell. She's on the board. I'm sure you've heard of her. She's infamous for the Georgia conversation around Trump and gathering the needed votes for him to, uh, to, to win Georgia. Um, she's someone who's been devoting her career to attacking the right to vote and to uh, even telling legislators that they should be destroying their notes about, um, uh, their notes about uh, voting, uh, about redistricting. Um, and uh, that was at an ALEC meeting, which I think Mo mentioned. And Sandra mentioned that's an American Legislative Exchange Council, which is a, a body that describes itself as the largest a body of state legislators in the country. And in fact, it's the largest body of state legislators funded by private right-wing interests to advance those that agenda, including a whole host of so-called model bills to um, privatize public schools, to advance charters, vouchers, the whole thing. We have done a, a tremendous amount of research in my previous work at CMD to expose how these um, Charter schools are basically deregulated by design. Uh, there's a lack of democratic accountability. There's no school boards. Uh, there's hardly any regulations that even cover the spending of money. It's a wasteland of uh, money that's been lost, spent, uh, bankrupt schools, closed schools, fraud, and the like. Um, but yet it has continued to move forward because it's such a big source of money. And the right wing, in particular, is very interested in advancing, uh, getting, uh, getting the, their hand in the till of our public schools. Um, let me just uh, move forward to the current situation. Um, as Mo and others mentioned, we have this proliferation 
of right-wing groups suddenly emerging, uh, Parents Defending Education, uh, Moms for Liberty, these are new groups. There's very little information about them. We have, in my day job, uncovered um, key components of their funding, but not everything. Other groups are longer standing, like the Independent Women's Forum, Independent Women's Voice that were launched um, in the aftermath or launched to help get Clarence Thomas confirmed the Supreme Court. They've all been working together to really push this attack on public schools. And as I think Diane mentioned and Jennifer and Mo, one of the things we've seen is how these spokespeople for these groups, including IWF, including PDE, Parents Defending Education, basically get airtime on TV as if they're just ordinary mere parents, part of this mythology. Um, but when in fact their day job is working for organizations that are devoted to basically undermining public schools and privatizing public schools. So there are a number of things that people can do in response to these groups. You can talk to each other about who they are. For example, um, as Mo mentioned, when we, when we um, looked at the Paris Defending Education, this is an article in Truth Out, what you could see was most of its funding uh, was not from t-shirt sales or the sale of goods um, or even parent membership. They had nearly in the first 990 that we could really see a full budget of nearly $3 million, only about $70,000 of that came from member dues, meaning parents. The re remaining you know, 2,930,000 plus came from super rich people who have antipathy toward public schools. But not just that, uh, Nikki Neely paid herself a bonus almost of the exact same amount as the membership dues by those parents. People should know that. They should know who is funding these groups that are attacking our public schools, attacking school boards. They should know whether their day job is working for an organization attacking public schools or trying to exploit the pandemic to attack public schools. They should know whether these uh, people are supporting this charterization or profitization of our schools uh, where there aren't certified teachers, where we don't have standards for the spending of our tax dollars, where we don't have accountability through uh, the responsibility of public uh, school boards or school superintendents. Um, these are vital facts, and they're facts that you have a right to know, in my view. And also, um, there's a wealth of information from Mo's writing, from Diane's writing, from Jennifer's writing, and more to help in, help you inform. One minute, Lisa. Yep to help you inform your fellow citizens, your fellow parents about what's really going on here and how they're using these cultural wars to try to distract and divide us as they seek to dismantle our public schools. Some of the people who've even spoken out or been featured on the news didn't even have parents in the public schools. Um, and that's aside from the other behavior we've seen this harassing, almost stalking behavior by some of the people associated with some of these groups. Um, so I'll conclude by saying there is a new resource that uh, my organization worked with Heal Together to develop um, that provides some tools for how, how to respond when you encounter these groups um, in your local school district, questions that should be asked, questions reporters should ask about them so that all people can be more informed about what's going on and how vital it is that we save and preserve and strengthen our public schools as essential to our democracy and how we actually need to have more funding, more support and more ways for kids to thrive um, uh, pursuing a range of skills and a, a range of uh, opportunities. Extracurricular is not just the testing regime that's been crammed down, but really help our kids thrive. And we can do that not through uh, religious indoctrination or having our money spent, our tax dollars spent on religious indoctrination through private religious organizations or schools like Betsy DeVos wants, but through actually ensuring that those investments are in all kids in universal education through our public schools. So thank you so much for having me, Sandra. It's a joy to be on the panel. Thank you very much, Lisa. And by the way, to those who are attending our webinar, uh, the panelists have offered, like Lisa, to send some links and articles for you to review. So when the YouTube video is finished and I send to all of you the, the link to that, I'll send some of these uh, resources Lisa and the others have mentioned too. Okay, uh, we're now moving into part two of our program. And I want to invite our four speakers to in kind of engage each other organically in a roundtable dialogue. As the moderator, I'm mostly going to try to stand back during this segment, but I'm going to let the speakers know when it's time to wrap up. Uh, given uh, during your discussion, uh, panelists, would you please take a moment to reflect on how today's extremist Supreme Court decision on affirmative action in higher education 
how that relates to our forum themes. Just take a minute. I know there's a lot else, but I, it clearly does. And I know you'll have something to say. So over to the forum roundtable. Why don't you start, Lisa? Why don't you start us off? The decision that just came down today on affirmative action, um, striking it down, you know, really is a blow toward efforts to reconcile and address the ongoing uh, structural racism that we see in American society that most people understand in terms of opportunity, in terms of trying to make sure that we have um, op ample opportunities for people to thrive in uh, university settings. This is a long-standing objective of the right wing in the United States, and it was accomplished in part because of the way the Supreme Court was packed with the help of Leonard Leo, who was mentioned earlier in this forum. Uh, and as Senator Whitehouse has so clearly um, described this court capture um, operation of Leo. So this is um, you know, one of those sort of right-wing reactionary decisions that they were hoping for, working for, and a number of the groups that were involved in that case in the amicus briefs are again, part of this right-wing network that is deeply connected to Leonard Leo's dark money, money machine, Charles Koch, and this whole um, broader sort of behind the scenes shadow effort to remake our law, to, to remake our rights and, and destroy um, protections um, that many Americans really hold dear, including uh, the opportunity to have schools that are really vibrant, thriving, um, places for people from all backgrounds where they can come, be admitted and succeed um, and not just have um, the residual and continuing effects of some of the racism in American society that continues uh, uh, make its way into our uh, uh, university education system. So I'll, I'll pass the baton to others. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in because I have a slightly different take on the decision today. It was I think everyone expected this decision and they expected it would be six to three, maybe five to four, but certainly uh, this was not a surprise. And I'm inclined to believe uh, that uh, what affirmative action has created is a professional class of people of color, a professional class of, of teachers, of, of people in every kind of professional role. And the university, well, first of all, most universities in this country, most colleges in this country accept everyone who applies. So the affirmative action ruling will not have any effect on them because everyone who applies gets in. For the elite schools, their culture has become so uh, inclusive and so devoted to having a diverse student population that I think that most of them will shrug this off and continue to have diverse student populations because they care about it. Uh, I think of what happened in my alma mater. Uh, I went to an elite women's college. They accept maybe one out of every four applicants or one out of five, one out of three, I don't know. But there is a competition. What does the end of affirmative action mean? Well, we have an African-American president and the director of admissions is an African-American. I don't think there's going to be any change in the ethnic uh, and demographic profile at Wellesley College. Uh, the new president of Harvard University is an accomplished African-American woman who is a social scientist. Uh, I suspect that without affirmative action, Harvard will continue to be ethnically, demographically diverse. I think this is true of most of the really great uh, elite institutions. There may be some that will say, well, now we can become all white and Asian, but I frankly don't see that happening because the norms have changed. And that's something that the Supreme Court can't roll back. I have a slightly different take and I'll warn you in advance that it's a little bit more, it's a little darker. And so after I, after I say this, you might want to refresh your cocktail um, because it is a little, my, my view, I read and listen to way too much of what the right says. And so I know that, that ultimately the goal is to roll back the entire, what they refer to in very derogatory terms as the civil rights regime. And that basically refers to any institution or law that, that works to make the country more equal. And I'll give you an example. One of DeSantis's higher education advisors, his top higher ed advisor in Florida, had a report called Florida Universities from Woke to Professionalism. And he makes the argument, one, there are too many people who go to college. Two, too many of them are women. And three, the next thing Florida and all states should do is criminalize the collection of data that tracks 
uh, people on the basis of race and gender. They are, it, it could absolutely be the case that Diane is right and that this decision does not have a huge impact uh, on higher the higher education landscape, but boy, what they are seeking to do goes so far beyond that. And what really creeps me out is just how they really don't feel any hesitancy about saying this out loud. I feel just like Lisa did when she was back in that meeting with Grover Norquist and his friends. Like, I can't believe you just blurted that out. Well, I hope we don't have uh, Ron DeSantis as the a paradigm of what might happen only because he's a full-fledged fascist in my view. Uh, I mean, I could come up with chapter and verse of 30 things that he's done to try to destroy academic freedom. He's already eliminated tenure uh, in higher education and they're going to be screening uh, anyone who comes up for tenure uh, to make sure that they're not teaching African-American studies, they're not teaching gender, they're not teaching this, they're not teaching that. And they, he is taking control of higher education in Florida in a way that is, frankly, I can't think of another word, but fascist. Um, and I, so far, uh, I guess Texas is the one that's right behind them, but that is not yet the Republican Party platform to destroy higher education, although it might become. I do think it's moving in that direction. I mean, I hope I hope you're right. I think it is moving in direction. I don't think there's a lot of interest in having well-educated uh, populace, and I particularly don't think there's there's, there's an interest uh, in having a, a populace that uh, reads great English literature, reads poetry, certainly does not read history, um, and and and, I, and so I think it's troubling. I think to the extent that education of any kind can prepare you for the for the workplace. Um, where you can become a middle manager at Walmart or, or work in coke industry somewhere is is okay. But things that have you questioning um, what this country has been about and what it professes to be about, I think, uh, are not long. I, you know, I, I taught at UMass Boston for many, many years. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, UMass Boston is at no risk of seeing its, its, its diverse population uh, um, affected here. Um, we had over 50% uh, diversity and, and that will, will stay. But I will say, you know, you hear often that uh, what's lost in the classroom if you don't have uh, diverse uh, effects, uh, diversity affects white students as well. Well, it affects white professors. I learned a whole lot from my, from my African-American students and my Latino students, all of my diverse students. It, it improved me and certainly improved my teaching. And uh, if this is at all, I hope, again, I hope Diana's right, but if this is, is affected uh, at universities across this nation, there's gonna be a high price to pay for it. So we should go back to you, Sandra, in terms of questions. No, nope, I'm still leaving this organic. What I'd like you all to do is go back to the basic theme and thank you so much for your Supreme Court uh, uh, viewpoints. I think this, since it was such an important event today, I'm very glad to have it. But you all in each of your presentations hit on the key themes. And I know, Jennifer, you wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the issue of unions. Well, only because you had specifically asked me to mention unions, and then I realized afterwards that I had forgotten. And I just wanted to emphasize, you know, like so often the, the critiques that we hear about teachers unions, which we were reminded of are the largest unions that we still have. The, the story that you hear again and again is that they are the impediment to academic success. But the real reason why the people and groups we've been hearing about don't like them has very little to do with academic success. It's because they are the largest and most effective organizers on behalf of a strengthened social safety net. And all you have to do is go state by state and look at the difference between states where unions are strong and what they have pushed for versus states that are, where unions have historically been weak or non-existent and look at the difference in the kinds of, of lives and outcomes that kids have. There is absolutely no comparison. And Lisa, I know that this is something that you have written. I have learned so much from you. So I'm passing the microphone. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, we did uh, do a lot of work around this. This was after um, there was a, a hack uh, from abroad of these Bradley files. And you could really finally see behind the scenes uh, what a significant role this private foundation of uh, that came out of the fortune of two brothers who were deeply anti-union 
how much money they have spent in this recent era attacking unions and trying to use the Supreme Court to undermine union rights. And that's what the Supreme Court did. It rolled back decades of law uh, in order to attack and try to undermine the power of unions uh, in their organizing, in their negotiation. And that's not the only thing we've seen. Uh, we've seen this assault um, in state after state, as Jennifer mentioned, and we see the result of these assaults on worker rights, on labor rights, in terms of the quality of, of um, living in those states. But also, um, I'm reminded that in Wisconsin, you know, that was really the first target. I, I live in Wisconsin. I um, also am in DC quite a bit. But um, you know, in that state, when Scott Walker became the governor, the first major effort was to really try to attack the power of public unions, where they were founded. You know, right there at the at the heart of it in Wisconsin, and not just that. Um, we actually litigated a case against Scott Walker that you can look up on the on the PR Watch site, where um, Scott Walker um, in 2015, uh, early before he declared really his effort to become president, but when he was you know uh, preparing for it, he actually tried to delete from the University of Wisconsin's mission statement the search for truth. Though that phrase. They wanted to eliminate it. And then they lied about it, said that they didn't do it. We actually litigated won that case, revealed that in fact it had come out of the governor's office. The idea that our public universities should not be engaged in the search for truth was astonishing. Um, and also the other part they wanted to change was they basically wanted to make sure the universities were creating workers for industries. Like that was the purpose. And that the funding would be based on that purpose, not based on the pursuit of scientific knowledge, uh, the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of information, but whether they're creating workers, which really goes back to um, that Koch thesis, that the role of uh, a society should not be engaged in public schools or public universities. That was Koch's thesis in the very first paper uh, published by the Center for Independent Education. And that, in fact, the one of the roots of that was that they, they didn't think that rich people should be paying for the education of other rich people's workers. This is just a deeply um, cynical, uh, deeply uh, um, selfish, um, you know, uh, and I think quite frankly immoral, um, at least amoral, if not immoral proposition, um, but it really is part of the way this billionaire class that has arisen in America is exerting excessive undue influence on our democracy at every level, from the school board uh, to the counties, to the cities, to the states, to the federal government, to Congress, and to the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as state Supreme Courts. And so we have a huge battle on our hand to try to save our democracy from this gross distortion that this U.S. Supreme Court has unleashed in part through the Citizens United decision and these other decisions uh, on voting rights, limiting voting rights and more. Um, we are not out of the woods. We have a lot more organizing to do as individuals to try to perfect, protect, defend and expand our democracy versus allow it to fall into uh, more regressive hands and to allow this deeply regressive money to have uh, to be allowed to have such um, undue and excessive influence. Do any of the others of you wish to make any more general comments ab about any of the themes? Well, if I can, if I can turn the theme a little bit now, we're talking to uh, Democrats here and so let's talk a little bit about the role of, of the Democrats in this. Uh, you know, you have uh, the group I always think about, of course, is Democrats for Education Reform. But then you've got Educators for Excellence, groups of teachers that, you know, it's the teacher's voice. And you have the National Parents Union. And when you look at something like National Parents Union or other similar, you see people of color. So what is going on with, with the, this bleeding away of, of uh, the, the Democrats uh, and their constituencies from uh, from uh, from from unions and from the Democratic Party. What's going on with that? Well, it's money. <laughs> it's money. People get paid, and and they uh, turn against whatever you would expect them to believe in. I mean, that we know, uh, and Jennifer alluded to this earlier, that the school choice movement was born during the desegregation era. Uh, and there have been some wonderful books written about this. Uh, I think of the one by Steve Suits, S-U-I-T-T-S. -T -T I think he was, he's with the Southern Education Foundation and uh, Overturning Brown. Uh, and Steve, Stephen Suits sh shows how so many laws were passed in Southern states for private academies uh, to be publicly funded. And those private academies today would be considered charter schools. 
uh, and similarly, uh, the, the voucher movement, many of the Southern states passed voucher programs. And uh, the intention was that white students should be allowed to get away from going to school uh, with black students. So the, this is very much a movement that was born a, in opposition to desegregation. So it's a great hoax that these folks have engaged in to say that school choice is the civil rights issue of our time. I mean, you almost have to laugh when you hear Betsy DeVos saying that, and she has said that many times. I used to hear Michael Bloomberg saying it. And how did these billionaires get the idea that they have any right or reason to uh, destroy America's public schools? Uh, but that's where we are, which is they're using false pretenses. Uh, one of the questions I saw on the screen was, well, how do we persuade people that vouchers don't help poor kids? They don't help poor kids. The evidence is there. We have a lot of voucher programs out there. And uh, most of the money in the voucher program is going to rich kids, not poor kids. And the poor kids who get vouchers fall behind. And many of them go back to public schools. So we're, we're just seeing a, a wrecking, giant wrecking ball that's being funded by incredibly wealthy people. They know exactly what they're doing. Thank you all. If, if, oh, oh, Lisa, go I'm, ahead. If I could <laughs> add, I just have to say uh, with Betsy DeVos, I mean, it really is astonishing because um, you know she was asked uh, at a uh, event before, you know, a couple years before she became the Secretary of Education, she was asked by a person like, you guys have a lot of money. Why are you not um, spending your own money to fund the types of schools that you want. And she basically said that they didn't have enough money. Even however rich they are, they did not have enough money. Um, she says there are not enough philanthropic dollars to fund basically what she needs. And so she says, our desire, this is a direct quote, our desire is to confront the culture in ways that will continue to advance God's kingdom. And then in that speech, um, her husband added how they wanted to have schools that uh, public schools, in essence, that trained people in their religious faith. Um, and they even attacked the idea of public schools, claiming that they had supposedly displaced churches as the proper center of American society. These views are certainly opinions that a person can have. They are inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States of America, which expressly prevents there from being an establishment of religion expressly bars religious oaths for office and expressly in article three of the constitution says that the constitution is the supreme law of the land not any religious text at all that's not to say that people can't have free exercise the constitution protects free exercise of religion but the idea that our public schools are supposed to become uh, vehicles for betsy devos's personal religious agenda is contrary to our like our basically our entire modern history and really the history of public schools in America and why they have been so accessible to people um, from all backgrounds in terms of teaching people the basic information about our society and knowledge. But also, um, I think public schools provide a moral education without reference to a specific religious text. Kids are taught not to cheat, not to steal, to treat each other kindly. These are you know, common universal expectations that you don't need a particular sect of religion in order for kids to understand those uh, basics about being a good society member, being a good citizen, being a good neighbor, being a good friend. Um, but you have people like Betsy DeVos who have tried to distort American policy to achieve that. And she also wrote an op-ed about 20 years ago, right before the dark money, um, uh, there was an effort through the Bipa Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, BICRA, which is McCain-Feingold law, to contain this dark money. She wrote an op-ed which basically said, of course they want something for their money. If they want a return on investment, this isn't benevolence, they want an ROI. Um, and of course the Supreme Court gave them an ROI and their uh, fellow billionaires in that Citizen United decision that unleashed this wave of dark money. But you know, it's not about uh, the benefit of our society, it's about them trying to impose their own religious beliefs as law and indoctrinate kids in their religious beliefs and not uh, in a, a educational system where in which everyone's right to freedom of conscience and their own family's religion is respected versus exalting some over the other, which is what I think that Carson versus Macon decision of the US Supreme Court last year did, is to advance this fundamentalist regressive right-wing view that our public tax dollars should in fact be funding schools that are indoctrinating kids um, and indoctrinating things, not just in their own religion, but also against the science of climate change, against the reality, accurate teaching of uh, history in America and more. So I just had to, I had to go off, I guess, and, and share my thoughts about Betsy DeVos. We, there's an article on my old website, PR Watch, 
five things to know about Betsy DeVos. It's all there with documentation. Yeah. Well, so I, I just want to throw in, if I may, Sandra, that the Supreme sure. Court has really uh, paved the way, not with today's decision, but with last year's decision about the state of Maine. And they paved the way to uh, say that states should pay for religious education uh, because uh, Maine has a tuitioning program, and I'm sure Mo knows a lot about this, as does Jennifer, uh, where if there's no public high school in your district, you can go to a private school. As long as it's not religious, you can go to a private school and the state pays, I don't know, all or part of your tuition. And so the the, there was two schools, evangelical schools in Maine, that said, this is not fair because why shouldn't students be able to come to our two schools uh, and have the state also pay for their tuition? And the, the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, in fact, Maine would have to pay for their to, uh, for kids who go to the, these particular two schools. Problem is, they only accept students of their own faith. They do explicitly exclude students who are LGBT. Uh, and if you're not a member of their faith community, you can neither be a teacher nor a student there. And so Maine is in the process of trying to pass an anti-discrimination law so that if they have to give money to these two evangelical schools, uh, that these schools would have to stop their discrimination. But in the meanwhile, the Supreme Court is allowing these programs. I mean, we have voucher programs all over the country that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. The Supreme Court was a rock in saying that there had to be separation of church and state. And now we're seeing that separation whittled away and the Establishment Clause is giving way to the uh, Freedom of Religion Clause, where people say, I can't be free to practice my religion unless I'm practicing it in, the, in a religious school. And yeah, uh, here's the issue for me. I'm all, I'm all for school choice if you pay for it yourself. I don't care if, if people want to send their kids to religious school. That's OK. They should pay for it. If they, if they want to use their local public school, the public will pay for it. But um, private choice is private money. Public choice is public money. It's really about who pays for it, not what they do at the school. That's a good way for us to end the round table and get in. We have a whole slew of questions. I know people are eager to have their questions answered. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say it's been a privilege to hear our, our expert panelists share their insights. and. We're really looking forward to getting more information through our questions. Um, I have asked my National Affairs Committee colleagues, Sherry Horowitz and Andy Scalise, to monitor the Q&A box throughout the program, sorting through and selecting some of your questions to ask the speakers. They will also ask some of the questions prepared by our committee. There clearly won't be enough time to ask every question. They're they will try to identify those that are on topic, not duplicates, and that address aspects of the issue not yet considered. Sherry and Andy, I may be, break in from time to time and I certainly will let you know when it's time to ask the last question. Sherry will conduct the first and Andy the second half of the Q&A. Let's begin your half of the Q&A, Sherry. Please take it away. All right. Um, first, someone at the very end asked, since there's so many questions and they probably won't all get answered, could they be sent to the uh, panelists for maybe answering later? So I'll throw that to you. You can address that whenever you want. Um, there were a number of people who were asking about Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin's education agenda. Um, so I'm going to throw this to uh, Dr. Berkshire. You've written about Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin's education agenda. Would you please share your analysis and connect the dots to the national right-wing education strategy that we're exposing in this forum? Yeah, thanks. Um, so one thing that has driven me um, pretty close to the edge, I'll admit it, is that I feel like the analysis of what happened in Virginia has been so inaccurate and just repeated again and again. And so the official take after the election was that, that Youngkin won because of uh, backlash over CRT, that that was really a big piece of it. And But if you actually paid attention to the race and listened to how his advisors talked about it, he very skillfully put together a coalition that included folks in rural areas who were really worked up about the litter boxes and the CRT, but also he spoke relentlessly to parents who were concerned about the quote unquote war on merit. The idea that if you change the admissions policy for the elite magnet school that their kids were going to 
uh, to pay a price for that and that he would restore a merit-based policy. And what he did that worked really well is he figured out a way to uh, put those people, those diverse groups of people together and it made a difference. So what does that tell us? Well, one thing, I think one heartening thing is that Republicans don't appear to have learned anything from that at all. If you listen, if you tune into the Moms for Liberty Summit this weekend, you will not hear anyone talking like Youngkin did because they have now moved to such an extreme uh, direction. Now, Youngkin has tried to sort of keep up with them and his, his uh, policy on trans kids in schools that someone, I saw this question in the uh, earlier, someone referring to it as bullying, and it's absolutely the case, right, that what he is doing is elevating a particular group of parents who have the ability to override other parents. And so if you're the parent of a child that decides that they uh, they want to change their pronoun, what matters so much isn't your opinion and knowledge, but whether some other group of parent organized into the kind of group that we've heard so much about. So I think the other thing that we have to pay, think about in terms of Yunkin's win and his platform is, frankly, what a dud of a candidate he beat. And I don't live in Virginia, so I can just blurt stuff like this out. But you know, here we have uh, here we have Terry McCullough, who sent all of his kids to private school, and how is he going to be the warrior that we need for public education when he's not invested in it himself? And then you know, finally, we talked. We heard Diane speaking so forcefully about how Democrats have been really bad about kind of laundering the language of school choice. Well, another thing that they've done is that they have really elevated education as our only economic solution. And this was totally a McAuliffe talking point as well. And I think it really, it makes them vulnerable to both the backlash among rural voters, uh, who some of the people on this call are trying to appeal to right now, but also those elite parents who feel like if their kids don't get a leg up, it is the end of the world. And to the extent that we're seeing uh, people follow the Yunkin playbook, it's in school board races in now in New York City and San Francisco, and Democrats need to figure out a response before the Republicans wake up and start using Yunkin's playbook as a model. Sorry for going on and on. Good. Um, this is a general question to anyone who wants to take it from William Boone. How can we turn the parent movement around and promote parent involvement in supporting and improvement, improving public schools? I think what, um, uh, and I think it might have been Jennifer or Diane who mentioned this, is that, that the polling actually shows that most Americans really strongly support their public schools and really strongly support their public school teachers. They're just not the squeaky wheels getting on the evening news with these sort of planned attacks on school boards uh, where you have sort of a squeaky wheel situation where there are parents who um, you know, may have their own legitimate uh, grievances, or they may be people who are associated with some of these right-wing groups, or using the talking points of these right-wing groups to attack the school boards, and they're the ones getting the public press. But most of the parents uh, in poll after poll actually support their schools and support their teachers, and are very grateful for um, their relationships with um, the schools that their kids go to. And so, um, so in essence, there's an optical there's an optics and then there's a reality. And the challenge in my view in part is um, helping to organize and support those parents who do want great public schools to be able to counter and have their uh, counter these attacks and this, this, these misleading claims, but also be able to be organized in a way that helps protect and defend our public schools and our democracy to help support their efforts uh, to be more visible um, in their support of schools. That's just one opinion. I think it's it's also important that in schools that don't have a voucher program, maybe even in, in, in sorry, in states that don't have a voucher program, uh, parents should organize and demand a referendum because there have been 20 or 25 referenda about vouchers. They have overwhelmingly, every one of them has been overwhelmingly defeated. So there is no public appetite for vouchers and the legislatures know it. And they try to push these programs through and make sure that parents have no voice. Uh, and I think that the 
if we talk correctly to parents, they will understand that they have power, they have many allies, and they have to get organized and say, we want to get on the ballot. That's the thing that the right wingers hate the most. Uh, there was going to be, Betsy DeVos was pushing uh, to pass a charter bill in Michigan in the last election, which was overwhelmingly, her, her bill never came to a vote because she was terrified of having a referendum. She was afraid that if her bill didn't pass, uh, there might be a referendum. And the referendum has always gone out like 75 to 25, 80 to 20 against vouchers. And she didn't get her bill through and there will be, no, this governor, Gretchen Whitmer, is not gonna allow an expansion of vouchers. But there's parent power and parents have to, have to be uh, organized and have to have leadership. Um, you, you talked about the problems with the uh, charter schools not being regulated. Are there any efforts to pass legislation to regulate them that you're aware of? Or should there be a push for that? Jennifer, do you want to talk about that? Well, it, there was some more Supreme Court news this week. And actually, the Supreme Court declined to take up a case that, that the right has been, a uh, tremendous coalition of people on the right have been supporting that would have declared that charter schools are quote unquote non-state actors. Meaning that for all we've heard about them being public schools, that they are actually private. Now this is not over. And so the, like part of what we're seeing is an effort to deregulate charter schools. And to the extent that the schools are effective, it's because they're, they're well-regulated. So for example, where, uh, where Mo and I are in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, um, it's, it's actually, it's quite difficult to open up a charter school. And so you have this tension between the vision of unfettered expansion coming from the right, and then what it actually takes to make these schools effective. Because if they're just left to their own devices, you end up with a situation like you have in Detroit, where schools are opening and closing all the time. And the result is just a tremendous situation of instability that's horrible for kids. And so I would recommend, I know there's a big debate, there's a push underway in, in Virginia to open so-called lab schools. So absolutely take a look at the, uh, the kinds of regulations that are necessary in order to keep schools from, from opening and closing and also for never opening, right? And the other thing that charter schools do, which you are probably aware of in, in Virginia, we see this in New York all the time, is that they choose their students and they choose their families. And they're very careful. I mean, our most successful charter chain in New York has tremendous attrition. Uh, it started, its first class had 100 kids and 16 of them graduated. And every year, uh, the same thing happens. They, the kids arrive, they accept it by lottery, and they get rid of them. And they push out some that have disabilities, and they push out others that are troublesome. And then they boast about their test scores of those that survive. The other problem that they have is tremendous teacher turnover. Up to 50% of their teachers every single year is a new, it will be a new teacher. So charters need regulation and, and it would be better for the charters if they were regulated. Uh, and every state has its own set of regulations. It's different everywhere. Uh, and Arizona for, and Texas are like the wild west and there is almost no regulation. And people do self-dealing. They, they have family members on the board of trustees. One charter chain in, in Arizona uh, had only one member of the board of trustees himself. He was also a member of the legislature. So <laughs> it, it, the, the, the hits never stopped coming. Thank you all. I'm gonna uh, close out Sherry's portion and uh, move over to Andy. Would you continue with your questions? Thank you, Sandra. And thank you to our panel. Um, I'll, I'll take two questions from the audience and kind of combine them into one. And it, it goes back to the, the decision from the Supreme Court this morning. Um, the, does the decision in this in the case this morning, uh, how is that likely to then be used to affect kind of the, the local high school level, like um, in obviously in Fairfax County, we have Thomas Jefferson High School and other magnet schools that have very selective admissions processes. And, does, and how are we going to now, how are they going to use that ruling to kind of change the, let's say, the progressive admissions process that we have there? And is it is it foreseeable in the future now from this ruling that there might be ways for schools and, and other districts to actively discriminate because of uh, the ruling that was put forth today. Uh, 
And this is for anybody on the panel. Well, I can tell you that in New York City, we have several uh, very selective high schools and they have only one way to gain admittance and that's through one test given on one day. And they have very, very, very few black and Hispanic students. And despite the fact that New York City is very liberal, New York State is relatively liberal, uh, the legislature simply will not change that one test only. And I think that, I don't know what Thomas Jefferson's requirements are, but I assume it's more than one test on one day, because this is why our selective schools are overwhelmingly, uh, predominantly Asian and uh, uh, Asian and white with maybe three to 4% uh, who are black kids. Uh, and this is unhealthy. So I, I don't think it'll have much effect on Thomas Jefferson per se, but I would hope that your admissions requirements would be uh, more diverse than just a single test. I saw a lot of people sort of breathing a sigh of relief after the decision today that they appeared to leave out K-12. Uh, but to me, that feels like a very temporary repeat, uh, reprieve. The, um, the, uh, I'm not sure what the, what is the status of the court case about admissions at TJ right now? Can, can you fill us in? I'm not completely familiar with where we are on it right now, but I do know that there has been a lot of back and forth and it is obviously a very controversial and concerning issue around here. We know that the admissions, uh, the changes in the admissions policies have led to a much better increase in the diversity of, of the enrollments. And that's and that's our concern is losing that now because there's theoretically or, or is there precedent for it? So the there is, this issue is not going away and it's not going away for, for several different reasons. One of them is that what I was talking about, that there's this tremendous energy on the right to roll back the entire architecture of civil rights. And so you will hear them talk in this very sort of anodyne way about, oh, we're just restoring merit. We're just elevating merit. Um, but the, you know, the idea is that any effort made by any organization or institution to affect a level of equality is unacceptable. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that it's politically explosive and it it actually, it works for Republicans to the extent that the, that the culture wars are resulting in electoral gains for Republicans. It's not the slash and burn Moms for Liberty stuff, it's this. It's the it's campaigns run on, you know, your this Democratic school board person wants to water down merit. They don't think academic achievement works. And so not only are we going to see this, but Democrats are going to have to figure out a better way to respond to it, because until they do, it's, you know, like think about the amount of ink that has been spilled in Virginia just on, on debating this and it's nowhere near resolved. Oh, I'd like to jump in. One of our attendees who's an attorney that I know someone on this call knows, Kristen Cabral, commented that the federal appellate court reversed and ruled for the Fairfax County Public Schools. Yeah. So go ahead, Andy. I just wanted to add that. You're, you're muted, Andy. Yep. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And thanks for the clarification. I apologize for not being up in my in my Fairfax County news sometimes. Um, the, the next question I have really is, again, I'm going to combine two questions from our audience. Um, it seems that some people in the audience tend to believe that there is some, uh, that there's some credibility to, to the argument that uh, we keep putting more money into our public school systems and the outcomes aren't as aren't aren't improving or, or aren't necessarily positive for all of our kids. Um, to what extent is that true and how do we handle that narrative? And also to what extent is that false and what are the misinformation tactics that are are leading that to be kind of kind of the belief? Because it's it's not just Republicans who feel that way. There, there are plenty of Democrats who feel that way as well. Well, for what it's worth, I wrote a book uh, that came out in 2013, and I don't think it's been disproven. And that is that uh, uh, American kids actually made progress for many decades. And based on the scores of the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, it, before the pandemic, this, our test scores were the highest they had ever been for every racial, racial group. Graduation rates were the highest they'd ever been. Uh, and 
the, the test score gap between whites and minorities has been fairly steady, although it's way lower. I, I'm sorry, it is way smaller today than it was 30 years ago. So we have been through a long period of improvement despite all the tremendous challenges to public education. Uh, we, we frequently will compare ourselves to countries that do not, for example, include kids with uh, disabilities. Uh, and they, they have, I remember when I was visiting Russia, they have something called the Department of Defectology <laughs> that studies the kids with disabilities. And they, they're not mainstreamed. And in many countries, they're not mainstreamed. And a lot of the costs that, uh, that you see going up and up are the cost of incorporating kids who previously were not allowed in. Uh, and so we have the cost of bilingual education, the cost of special education. And uh, we're still, despite the rising cost, uh, there are many states that are spending far too little uh, and not spending enough on teacher salaries, for instance, or on reducing class size. These are very effective ways to improve achievement. So the the I love that question because the answer to it was right there in that Cato industry chart that I showed you. It shows just how effective that that message has been. And, you know, I would encourage when you hear that, I would want to know, and this is partly because uh, because I'm a journalist, I would want to know when I hear that from a Democrat or a Republican, what is their vision of why we have public schools? And because often you'll find that they're, you know, like they may be saying that the uh, considering how much we spend, test scores should be higher. Well, what does that mean? You know why? Like, if you actually want ask them what what it is that they want for their own kids, they're going to talk about things like qualified teachers and all sorts of electives. I doubt they're folk hyper focused on a narrow metric like test scores. So I would use that as a conversation starter, and I would remind them that when you know, like, if 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 we think about that Cato graph, their ultimate goal is to have us spend nothing on public education, that the that the goal is to have parents pay for it themselves to the extent that they're able. And then we'll have something, the equivalent of Medicaid uh, for schools, for kids whose families can't afford to pay anything. But use that as a conversation starter, as opposed to getting very defensive about the amount of money that we spend. Andy, you're on mute. I know I was waiting to see if any anybody else wanted to chime in, but I think Sandra, we only have probably what three minutes left of questions. So I'd I'd like to kind of go into what I kind of see as the the last one. I, I hope all of our of our panelists can can respond here. And this is probably the question that comes at every at the end of every panel, um, because you have still a hundred almost two hundred people in the room who um, are all here and they're interested in in taking what you've taught us today and and moving forward. And and I think that's the question: is what do we do about it? Um, you know, we're we're activists. Uh, you know, I I have family in the in the room here with me, and I can tell them everything I've learned today. But um, that may not be enough. What what do we do? How do we really go and and take what we've learned and, and make make the changes we need to make? And we know it's not going to be done tomorrow, but um, we can start tomorrow. Well, you could begin by electing people to your legislature who are committed to the public schools. Uh, and you know, it just to me, it makes no sense to say. Uh, we have this pie and let's divide it up three ways. And in all three sectors, I, I think of Milwaukee, for instance, which has public schools, vouchers and charters. They all do very poorly and they all do about the same. And I think to myself, why wouldn't they just combine them all and call them public schools and have strong neighborhood public schools? And I think about, for example, what we consider the best education system in the world is Finland. And Finland has no private schools. It has no charter schools. And every school, every school is a public school and every school is a good school. So it doesn't matter what school you go to because they're all good schools. And I would think we would have that as the ideal for what we want in our country. What every school you want to go to is a good school. And, and choice and competition, all of that, these are not reform strategies. We have been uh, hoaxed into accepting a kind of a corporatist reform uh, formula, uh, which penalizes teachers if their kids don't get higher scores, penalizes and stigmatizes students. And the purpose of education is not to get high test scores. The purpose of education is to build better citizens and make this a stronger country. Yeah, 
I, I'd add something with, with just with respect to how to how to fight back on this, which is we've talked about organizing. Have some confidence. You've got the majority. Go out, go out and tell people you you got the majority. Uh, you know, why? The, the, let's get back to the title of the panel: It's dark money. Why is there dark money? There's dark money really for two basic reasons. One is the people pushing this, the money people, know that their uh, uh, viewpoints are unpopular with people, that, that, that the mass of us want different things. And the second thing is they know that we get suspicious when we find out that it's really, you know, not moms for this or parents for that. It's Walton. It's Coke. You know, it's, it, it's, it's the folks funding City Fund and other operations like that. Uh, and so have some confidence that if you you organize, if you talk to your neighbors, you'll go out there and beat these folks. They've got a big megaphone because it's because it's it's money behind it. But you can absolutely go out there. Jen did a piece not long ago about I think it's the Jacksonville mayor thing. First time a Democrat's won Jacksonville mayor in I don't know how long, a DeSantis back person, but all wrong all wrong. And the Democrats went out and beat that person. It's happening to Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty got clobbered this spring in, in school board races. And that's going to happen again and again if we stand up to them. I want to go next because I want to give Jennifer the last word and not be the last word, if that's all right, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay. I, I just wanted to add, uh, to add to that to, you know, just um, uh, say that one of the things that's been astonishing to me in this um, a reallocation of our public funds into the private sector is that, for example, K-12, uh, which advertises um, on the air, um, on the radio in Wisconsin, they, they get our tax dollars, our public monies, and then they spend a portion of that on advertising to get kids to go to their schools. We don't have any budget for a public school to do advertising on the radio to get kids to go to our public schools, but there's not even a, a hint of um, you know of a, a reaction to the idea that that's our money promoting the privatization of public schools. So in essence, we we can't in essence compete by running ads that counter like what we're seeing with these charter schools. But what we have instead is the ability of uh, parents to organize and be the PR, be the ambassadors for the schools, join together in that. And it's not a November 2023 thing alone. It's a year round. Thing. And I know parents have really been through the ringer with the pandemic and, you know, all the challenges that that is involved in terms of kids, uh, their education, as well as like home and structure and schedules. But the reality is, is that we, we are in this together. And as Mo said, um, and I think Diane said as well, like we, we are in the majority of people who support public schools. And so, you know, it just requires us to redouble or triple that those efforts at dialogue to really encourage our friends, families, neighbors to stand up together for public schools um, and to do so you know, month in and month out to really help make our public schools thrive because that's what we, that's what we should have, schools that thrive, thrive uh, public schools that thrive. And the only way we can achieve that is through supporting well-paid teachers, supporting well-funded public schools, supporting programs that serve the needs of all of our, our kids um, and that make sure that people have opportunities, not just for testing programs, but actually for a variety of things that will help uh, kids thrive and test their skills and you know, be happy. Um, and I think that's what parents want, their wishes for their kids to be happy and, uh, and to thrive. And so that's the mission uh, that I think we all have. So with that, I'll just say, it's an honor to be on the panel with Diane and, and Morris and Jennifer and pass the baton to you. Well, I, I would just echo that and say, you know, I've had the privilege, both as a writer and having an education podcast, to get to talk to people all over the country who are involved in what I think of as the backlash to the backlash. And just as, you know, as Mo was saying that there's a there's the same origin story for every one of these quote unquote parent groups that forms, there's the same story about successful organizing. That, that what you see are just are great grassroots coalitions coming together, supporting one another, articulating a vision of what they're for, because the culture war candidates are only there to talk about what's wrong. And, and then I think, you know, like what's so key in all of that is that they are, these groups are remembering how to do democracy. 
And that's why it's so important that this event tonight is a Democratic Party event, but also that there are people who are running for local elected office. Because if we're going to keep this institution not just surviving, but thriving and, and make it stronger, we're going to have to learn to talk about a public good, and we're going to have to learn, remember how to do democracy again. Great way to end the Q&A section. I'd like to say on behalf of FCDC National Affairs Committee and our Virginia Democratic Committee co-sponsors, I want to thank our distinguished panelists for your in-depth analyses of the right-wing GOP agenda to destroy public education and your strategies to kind of fight back. And I thank my colleagues as well, uh, Andy and Sherry, for helping. I also want to thank our audience for your interest, your attention, and your activism. Our democracy requires informed citizens. Public education enables its citizens to develop their full potential, which enables, as everyone's been saying, our democracy to flourish. It enables individuals to learn and grow and creates a successful and prosperous society. The coordinated dark money right-wing Republican agenda to dismantle public, ed uh, public education is dangerous for our democracy and our freedoms, and it harms the most vulnerable among us. Most American parents, students, teachers do not agree with this privatization and curriculum limiting scheme. And many genuine grassroots local parents are standing up for schools that protects kids' health, protect kids' health, teach the truth, and promote equality for all. And they are, as you've been hearing, organizing to fight back through such groups as Defense Against Democracy, Red, Wine, and Blue, Stop, all kinds of Stop Moms for Liberty Facebook groups and many other organizations. Locally, we have a group called For the Number Four Public Education, and we have an upcoming Women's Summit that actually will have a track on public education at the July 22 meeting. Uh, please join the fight. Don't fall for the ginned up right-wing culture war traps. When confronted by them, pivot, reframe, and explain the elements of the real right-wing agenda to dismantle public education that imperils our children's future, our society, and our democracy. I'd like to end with some good news from Virginia, where on June 24th, the Democratic Party of Virginia took an important and timely counteroffensive action by ratifying a resolution entitled, the Democratic Party of Virginia condemns the right-wing, dark money-funded Republican agenda to dismantle public education, divert public education funding to private education management, and eliminate critical thinking and evidence-based curricula. That completes our forum. We thank you for joining us. Keep fighting. Uh, we wish you good night. Uh, victory in our mutual struggle to save public education and democratic electoral victories in November. Thanks, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Nice to see y'all.